President Benton, it is my privilege to present a man who helped us all realize that watching real people like ourselves, some who emerge as heroes and others challenged by vexing problems, is a lot more entertaining and rewarding than it sounds. Mark Burnett is an executive producer in the entertainment industry whom many credit with introducing reality TV to the United States. His productions include now classic reality shows like Survivor, America's longest running reality franchise, The Apprentice, Rockstar, and Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader, which I think you all are by <laughs> getting your diplomas today. Acclaimed by fans and industry professionals alike, he has collected since 2001 two Emmys, 51 Emmy nominations, and four People's Choice Awards. Time Magazine has named him one of the most influential people in the world. A devoted husband to his wife, Roma Downey, and father to their three children, Mark Burnett is a man who shares his successes and his story. He authored four books, including Dare to Succeed and Jump In, has worked with the charity Operation Smile, and serves on professional and philanthropic boards, including the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. President Benton, it is indeed a privilege and an honor to present Mark Burnett for Pepperdine University's preeminent award, the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree. Again, thank you, Dean Livingstone, Mark Burnett. Because of your talent for turning the eye of the American public back on itself, casting our gazes upon our own hopes, fears, failures, and triumphs, in such a way that we are surprised, entertained, and often inspired. Because of your commitment to your craft, striving for excellence in production values and storytelling that is acclaimed by colleagues and fans alike. Because of your devotion to your wife, Roma, and the family that you share, and extending the compassion and caring beyond into the causes that you support. Because the example of your life demonstrating the value of seeing and seizing opportunities is an inspiration to us all, especially to our students. Therefore, by the power vested in me by the Pepperdine University Board of Regents, I confer upon you the honorary doctor of humane letters degree with all the duties, all the rights, and all the privileges thereto appertaining. Congratulations, Dr. Burnett. Good morning, everybody. I was um, immediately grateful when President Benton um, asked Roma and I to be here today to share this day with you. But I'm way more grateful at this moment for the first time ever in my marriage to get the last word. <laughs> Thank you, Roma. Something else that struck me this morning as I was walking up here and um, really focused for the first time on the beautiful seal of Pepperdine University which, you know, is very, very beautifully designed. I didn't realize, though, that none of you had paid for your education. Look, freely you received. <laughs> Who knew that Pepperdine didn't charge you for this um, great education? Wow. I'm going to come next week. As I look out here, you know, and I was actually thinking, you know, as we were all waiting, that beautiful music we heard, you know, I've actually um, heard and enjoyed for my entire life. Some of the words of the music we heard, you should know, are land of hope and glory, mother of the free. And as I look out, I see great hope for our country from all of you. I mean, the education you've received is phenomenal. And you are the hope. You are the leaders that I believe give us as a nation the chance to put Americans back to work. I believe all of you have the chance to design and create innovative businesses, business solutions, business models. You are absolutely the hope for all of us and our children going forward because leadership and creating these opportunities is why Roma and I moved to the United States of America and became American citizens. It's the greatest place on earth. It's the most nurturing, the most innovative, and you, sitting there today, are the absolute hope for all of us as you innovate going forward. 
you know, it's one thing getting <clears throat> the education and, and, and graduating the way you have, but you do now have to put it into practice. There's a few things I'd like to leave you with today of the things that I've learned, and I don't want to be pr presumptuous, but to share with you things that I've taken away from my experience in America as I've forged new paths. One of them is something I, you know, obviously on Survivor, I've spent a lot of time around the world. And I remember once in the high Atlas Mountains of Morocco, above the Sahara Desert, meeting the Berber tribespeople. These people live in the high valleys at 14,000 feet above the Sahara, which they live in those high valleys during the summer months when it's too hot in the Sahara. But then when, it, when the snows come in the high mountains, they need to move their entire families, extended families, over these mountain peaks before the snow comes to resettle in the Sahara Desert for the winter, because it's cool enough in the Sahara. Imagine the journey, taking your, your grandchildren, your children, yourself, your parents, grandparents, because they live extended lives, and moving, but they tend to join with other families to make these journeys. And an old, old Berber tribesman told me something I'm gonna share with you that you must never forget. He said, the way that we make it, with hundreds of people on this perilous, mountainous journey to the Sahara, is because we know that the most important thing to do is choose your companions before you choose the road. Because it's not physical prowess or technical expertise that it takes to make it or not make it, it's the camaraderie and the energy of the people you're traveling with, be it a marriage, your social groups, and in this case, your business groups. Think about this. The people you choose to associate and work with and hire as you innovate these great businesses for our country is going to depend on the people you associate with. And why? Because if you think about energy, energy is clearly one of the most important things we have to consider at all times. And energy can be given to us by the people we associate with or very quickly taken away. Imagine your energy force as in the morning when you go off to create these businesses and work, you're filling the bath at home to the brim with clear, fresh water. But as you leave to go about your day, you're cracking the plug slightly, and the water, your energy, starts to drain at a steady rate. By the time you come home, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, if you're really giving, and trying to create, you will work those hours. You just get into bed, and the last drop of water goes, and you've made it through your day. But what is it that pulls the plug out completely and drains all of your energy? It's associating with the wrong people. I call these people energy suckers. <laughs> not energy givers, they're gonna suck your energy. And it's your responsibility, not mine, not the universities, for you to be able to make decisions of who you see are the energy givers in a business unit to create more energy to succeed, or to avoid those energy suckers and have the visual in your mind as you feel those people, you know those people right now. You know them and you'll meet them going forward. You must spot the people that are not good for your family, for your business, and visualize that person Look in your eyes and pulling your plug out and draining your energy. Avoid those people at all costs. You know, Roma mentioned um, Indiana Jones, and it, something came to mind. You know, you have to make decisions, it's decisions about who to associate with, what businesses to do. And the, one of the roots of the word decision comes from uh, incisis, to cut off. When you think about Indiana Jones, he would always go across a rope bridge and cut off behind him. He made a decision, and that's why the root is to cut off, because a decision isn't a light thing to do. You have to think through and make those decisions to go forward and the decisions to change. Change is very important. 
very important. Think about the sensory acuity that all of you who are very smart and therefore supposed to be able to pay attention to what you're doing. It's not enough to have the degree. You've got to do something with it now. And the only thing that's going to really hold you back are the people you associate with, making decisions, the ability to be brave enough to make decisions, and to notice what are you getting back from your actions. Think about an aeroplane that takes off from New York, sets the coordinates, and is going to Los Angeles. If the computer and the pilots sat back and did nothing but plug in the Los Angeles coordinates from New York, would the plane arrive in LA? Would it? No, it wouldn't. The plane couldn't arrive because things change with the wind, the atmosphere. The plane would arrive in Alaska or Mexico or somewhere. It certainly wouldn't make it to LA. You know how it gets here? It gets here because the pilots on the computer, every 30 seconds, are making changes. They're noticing sensory acuity that the plane isn't on course. You are that plane. You'll set your goals, you'll associate with the right people, you'll make decisions, but if you don't keep paying attention to what's going on and have the courage to make decisions and changes, you won't arrive at the destination you want. And it's your responsibility, your personal responsibility, to pay attention to your actions and what you're getting back. The last thing I'll close with is keeping your word. It's very important. You know, you're all experts. You know how to hire the right lawyers and make clever contracts and big, thick contracts. But you know, when you put those contracts in the drawer, you never want to pull them out. You really want to go on really your word. The meeting of the minds with other people, you know, and keeping your word. And I'll end with a little story, actually, about Donald Trump. You know, I was in the Amazon jungle making Survivor number six, Survivor the Amazon. And at that point, I'd done 12 eco challenges and six survivors. I mean, like 18 jobs, shows, where I'd lived in remote places. And while it's cool to travel, it was kind of getting a little old. I was here in the Amazon jungle where everything around me could basically kill me and probably wanted to. From the piranhas that cameramen drop in their lens caps in the Amazon and getting chewed by piranhas, jaguars circling the survivors at night, and what are we going to do about that? Every little snake and spider could kill you. An anaconda slithered one night, for truth, through tribal council while filming. And I was really saying to myself, you know, what am I doing? Can I not get a job in a city? <laughs> I've got to come up with something to actually stay at home and be in an American city making, making a, a, a show. But where? And I noticed like millions of ants devouring some carcass and all these ants. And I thought to myself, New York City. You can't even get a cup of coffee at Starbucks without a little fight to get to the counter in New York City. And I thought, what would I do? What do Americans need? And I thought to myself, you know, jobs. And I started thinking, how about a televised job interview? But not nonsense where you make up a resume and hope they don't check up the references. A job interview where you actually got to do something. They're going to give you tasks, and over a three-month period, the employer will actually know what you're made of. Yeah, you've got the degree, but I want to see what you can do. You know, don't tell me, show me. And then I'm thinking, well, what would it be? What would the job be? It's got to be something pretty big and dramatic for TV. And I remembered a year earlier when doing the finale of Survivor Number 4, the Marquesas, we did it in New York City, and I rented Donald Trump's skating rink, the Trump Warman skating rink, to do the, to do the shoot. And Mr. Trump, as I got up there to address the 5,000 people about to go live, we were about seven minutes from being live on television on CBS. Kind of scary, anything could go wrong. And I saw Donald Trump sitting right in the front of his skating rink that I had leased from him. I only spent a few minutes with him before, but I knew one thing about Donald Trump. He does like his name. <laughs> his name's on everything. So I got up there and said, thank you, everybody. We're about to go live on television, but it, I, I sincerely must thank Mr. Donald Trump for allowing us to use the Trump Warman skating rink because the Trump Warman skating rink is a fantastic place that Mr. Trump built for the good people of New York City. And Mr. Trump 
and the Trump Woman skating ring is a great place, and Trump, Trump, Trumpity Trump, Trump. <laughs> now, Donald's smile was this big. <laughs> the only thing Donald likes more than cameras is his name. I didn't think much more about it, but when I got off, he'd said, you're a genius, I love Survivor. <laughs> Let's work together sometime. Cut to the Amazon. I want to do a show in America to escape the spiders and the snakes. I want the, job, the show to be about finding a job, but I need a boss. Bling. Bling. <laughs> Donald Trump. So I, I devise it, and I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to be there for 10 days, and I'm going to get myself um, ready for this pitch with Donald Trump. Who's like, he's heard every sales pitch in the world, this guy. Got to be, it's hard to sell a salesman. So as I'm coming in from, from uh, JFK, I'm on the LIE, and I call ahead to Trump's office with a view to setting an appointment 10 days hence when I'm ready. He answered the phone. <laughs> For a moment, I thought of hanging up quickly. You know how you do? <laughs> But I had the courage for a moment and said, uh, Mr. Trump, it's Mark Burnett. He said, yeah, survivor, genius. Uh, oh, that's a good start. I said, well, <laughs> Mr. Trump, I, I want to talk to you about an idea for a show. You mentioned we could maybe work together. I've got an idea for a show for you. He said, great, where are you? I said, I'm on the Long Island Expressway making my way into Manhattan. And he cut me off. I didn't get a chance to say I'd like to do it in a week. He said, you know where Trump Tower is? The guards will be expecting you. I'll see you in 25 minutes, click. I stared at the phone. I was thinking, oh no, I'm not ready for this. Should I call back and say, I'm sorry, I have another appointment. I felt I'd be so weak, I went. I walked in there unprepared, but congruent of what I was thinking and ready to adapt and pitched Donald Trump, the apprentice. He said nothing for a while and then he said, you know, Everybody's wanted me to do an Osborne's type show. They'll see me brushing my teeth, adjusting my hair in the morning. But I don't want to do that. This show sounds smart. It's good for business. Let's do it. Go out there to Norma, my assistant of many years. She'll get you on with my agent, William Morris. We're doing this. It's just a matter of paperwork now. I walked out so relieved. I literally got Donald Trump to host my show, which I knew would help me sell it and make it happen. And Norma said, how'd it go, Mark? I said, he loved it. We're going to do this. We've just got to call Jim, the agent of William Morris. She said, OK, no problem. I'll get him on the phone. I'd met Jim Griffin before. And uh, I said, hey, it's Mark Burnett. Great news. I just left Donald Trump's office, pitched him an idea for The Apprentice. He wants to do it. And then Jim deflated me. He said, how dare you? You know the rules. You've been more than a decade in television now. You go through the agent. You don't go directly to the client. I said, but Jim, I, I was going to set a meeting for a week's time. He said, come in. I, he said, Mark, I don't want to hear excuses. I can't approve this. I said, but, but why? He said, I don't even know what it is. I said, I'll tell you right now. He said, pitch me right now. And I, you, know, you know the exhaustion of doing something like that. I, my energy was a little gone. But I got the courage up, and I re-pitched The Apprentice to Jim on the phone. And Norman was giving me thumbs up. Sounds great, sounds great. And luckily for me, Jim liked it. Not. Jim hated it. Jim said, you may have done well with Survivor, but this is not for Donald Trump. I can't approve this. I'm going to say no. It was an awful feeling. It really was like my plug had been pulled out of that bathtub. My energy all went. I was so disappointed. The ups and downs of life. I had to come out. And I said to Norma, it didn't work out. I better go and tell Mr. Trump. So I walk around the corner to his office and he said, who is it? I said, uh, Donald, it's uh, Mark. He said, come on in. Did you get it sorted out? Is it done? I said, well, actually, uh, Jim made me re-pitch the whole thing. He said, what? I said, and he hated it. He said, he stood up and said, didn't I just shake your hand before and say we were doing this? I said, yes. He said, Norma, come in here. Take a letter to William Morris from me. Dear Jim, you're fired. <laughs> and think what you want and say what you want about my buddy Donald Trump. There's a man who kept his word and was still on the air.
Thank you so much for allowing me to share this time.